Many of my viewers today, on the 30th of October 2021, would be thinking perhaps of the G20 summit in Rome, or they might be thinking of all the preparations and the upcoming meetings for COP26 in Glasgow. Some others might only be thinking of putting the clocks back an hour uh, tonight as the United Kingdom goes away from British summer time and becomes synchronous with GMT Greenwich Mean Time. Or, for all I know, people would only want on a Saturday some light entertainment and are looking forward to strictly tonight. But closer to my uh, neighborhood, the Middle East, North Africa, and Gulf regions, it is quite possible that some of the viewers would be interested in the latest spat between uh, Saudi Arabia and Lebanon over the statements of the Minister of Information in Lebanon, Georges Gardahi, statements he made before he was appointed uh, minister, and that has basically increased the tensions or ramped up the tensions between the Gulf countries and Lebanon. Or for that matter, they might be thinking of the coup in Sudan, a coup that is now being described uh, in a twist of euphemism as a separation rather than a coup between the civilian and the military components of the transitional government. Or, for that matter, they might be thinking of Iraq. Iraq, which a commentator recently resembled a pen. Yes, a pen that you write with, held in a hand with five fingers, each finger representing one uh, political party, and how those five fingers basically manipulate and control the pen. In other words, political parties manipulating and controlling uh, the government. Or alternatively, and seriously enough, some people might still be thinking about how the Defense Minister of Israel, Benny Gantz, designated six human rights organizations in Palestine, chief amongst them Al-Haq, as terrorist organizations because he claimed that they work with and finance the PFLP. But I'm not going to do any of these for my 35th episode of Intuitive Reactions, the MENA and Gulf regions. Instead, today, I'm going to roll back the years. In fact, I'm going to go back to 30 years, to the 30th of October, 1991, and to the start of the Madrid peace conference between Arabs and Israelis. Now, some of you weren't even born then. Some of you haven't probably even heard of the Madrid conference. And those of you who have probably discarded it as being another one of those insignificant stations along the Israeli-Arab uh, course. But let me remind you that that was during the time when uh, George H.W. Bush, George Sr. or George the father, Bush the father, was president of the United States, and James Baker was his secretary of state, who was involved in an endless round of diplomacy, shuttle diplomacy, between Israel and the Arab countries in order to convene a meeting where Arabs and Israelis would sit face to face and negotiate the future of this conflict that had pretty much uh, marked their political lives for decades. And there were there was a concatenation of circumstances that probably encouraged and helped uh, President George H.W. Bush to push strongly for this uh, conference. One of them was that he himself wanted it very much. He wanted it to happen. And all those rounds of shuttle diplomacy by James Baker were pretty much to make this wish happen. 
But don't forget, there had also been an intifada, a Palestinian intifada in 1987, three, four years before the Madrid conference, which had set him down a marker, an intifada that in my opinion, for all intents and purposes, won one of the most successful political expressions uh, by the Palestinian people. Add to that the fact that King Hussein, the late King Hussein of Jordan, had dissociated his kingdom from the West Bank in 1988, giving a free hand to the Palestinians and to Yasser Arafat to negotiate the future of this small parcel of land. Then there had also been the 1991 Iraqi invasion of Kuwait earlier in the year, which had basically brought together a coalition of Arab countries with uh, the United States and some European countries, and which probably helped establish a sense of uh, atmosphere for this conference to be held. And last but not least, there was also the stick, not only the carrot. And the stick was the loan guarantees for Israel that were used by the US administration as a pressure point to get Yitzhak Shamir, the then prime minister of Israel, kicking and screaming to come to Madrid for this conference. Now, the conference is an Arab-Israeli conference not yet an Israeli-Palestinian one. And there were representatives from Syria, from Lebanon. The Lebanese representatives or delegation were pretty much under the tutelage of the Syrian delegation, but they still had their own separate table. Then there were the Egyptians. There were representatives from the Gulf region, from the GCC. I think, if I'm not mistaken, it was an Emirati. And then the European Union, the UN, and other organizations. But key to this conference was the joint delegation of Jordanians and Palestinians. Now, why joint delegation and not a separate Jordanian delegation and a separate a Palestinian delegation, simply because Yitzhak Shamir and the Israeli government refused point blank to discuss or deal or sit down in a room with Palestinian representatives of the PLO, and therefore a kind of a solution, a compromise solution, was to incorporate the Palestinian delegation ostensibly from within Palestinian occupied territories and not from the uh, PLO outside the country to sit with the Jordanians together, although everybody knew that there were two delegations working together, but negotiating on different issues. In fact, if you looked at that joint delegation at the time, you will have seen that the spokesperson for the Jordanians was Dr. Marwan Masher, and the spokesperson for the Palestinian delegation was Dr. Hanan Ashraoui. Now, the conference itself, the Madrid conference, lasted from the 30th of uh, October, 30 days, 30 years to the day today to the 4th of November. And that included the bilateral working groups, not only the plenary uh, sessions. And eventually it led, of course, as history has taught us, to Yitzhak Shamir going out and uh, Yitzhak Rabin uh, coming in with his more hopeful, more progressive, but extremely slow and cautious uh, policies that did not see uh, the light of day. Now, let me take a pause here and just share something personal with uh, you, my viewers. This is the Madrid Conference 1991. It's pretty much when my involvement with the Arab-Israeli and more prominently with the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict started. This is where I started earning my stripes in terms of politics, in terms of track two negotiations, in terms of becoming involved with the whole Israel-Palestine drama. How and why? 
Well, I was working with the Middle East Council of Churches as assistant to the general secretary. Gabriel Habib, the general secretary, called me into his office. We had a long chat as the Madrid conference was being put together. And he said to me, you know what, Harry? You're Jordanian. You know the region fairly well. We as Middle East Council of Churches represent all the churches of the MENA uh, region. Therefore, I would like you to follow this conference and report to me, then report to the General Assembly of the MECC as to what you thought was achieved or not achieved, the dynamics of the uh, conference. And interestingly enough, that was the first dip into the pond that I call Israel-Palestine and on which I've spoken, written. There is a book, the image is behind me as you can see for years and years and years, actually for 30 years, for three decades I've been involved with this uh, conflict. And interestingly enough, the, the input I had into the Madrid conference or the card that I had to help me know what was happening in the conference was Dr. Albert Agazarian, another Armenian from Jerusalem, who was the assistant to Dr. Hanan Ashrawi during those uh, talks and negotiations in Madrid. He and I were friends. Some of you will have heard of Albert Agazarian. Some of you will have known him. He was one of the impressive Armenians of Jerusalem, living in the old city in the Armenian quarter. And he and I were friends. And so what I used to do is call him on his private line every day and have a chat with him as to what was happening there. So even though I wasn't there, and why would I be there? Uh, I wasn't even known at all at the time. I got a fairly good briefing from Albert, the late Albert Agazarian, unfortunately he passed away a short while back, on what was happening there. Now, of course, we talk about the Madrid conference, we talk about what happened in Madrid, but Madrid was not really successful. Madrid led, in a sense, in a way, directly or indirectly, to meetings in Oslo, secret meetings, meetings that most people were not aware of. And that led to the 13th of September, 1993, and the DOP, the Declaration of uh, Principles, and the Oslo track that on paper at least consolidated the two state solution, Israel, Palestine. This process is now maligned and the two state solution has become a fig leaf for total inaction by Israel, which does not want to give back the occupied lands and simply wants to manage the occupation, as well as the international community, especially the European Union. And I point to the European Union because of its economic weight, but political inaction, that every now and then whimpers a few protests about what Israel is doing or not doing and leaves it uh, there. As for instance, it did recently with those six human rights organizations that were designated as terror related uh, by Israel. So this is what Madrid led to. But Madrid had, I think, one or two characteristics. A positive characteristics for me as somebody who's been deeply involved in conflict resolution in alternative dispute resolution and track to negotiations over the past 30 years. It broke the taboo of direct meetings. It is, it was a conference that had people sitting in the same room and more importantly, having bilateral meetings away from the plenary. That was a first, more or less, officially, publicly, uh, between Arab countries and Israel. It also, by the way, 
led in an indirect circumquitous way to the Israel-Jordan Treaty of 1994. So that to a sense in a way was the positive aspect, the credit line of uh, the Madrid conference, because other than that, Yitzhak Shamir was in no mood to do anything but be there because he was forced uh, to be there. But the negative characteristic, the most negative, the most debit line of this whole conference was the fact that in all the discussions that were held, in all the uh, the uh, talks, the conversations uh, that were held, settlements were not discussed. And I think settlements have been antithetical, they've been the curse of the two-state solution, and they've been the failure of anything from Madrid to Oslo to date. Why? Because during the Madrid conference, there were roughly 200 thousand plus settlers in the West Bank. Do you know how many there are today? Something like 750,000 uh, settlers. Only today, 30th of October, 2021, a Saturday, Yolande Nell from the BBC, a wonderful uh, correspondent, did a piece about an outpost, not a settlement, an outpost on a hilltop in Baita, which is near Nablus in the northern West Bank of Palestine. This outpost is illegal, not only under international law, as are all other settlements, but also under Israeli law. And yet, those settlers who came to take over, to confiscate the Palestinian hilltop and wreak havoc with Palestinians as they're doing elsewhere during the olive harvesting season, they have now been promised by the Israeli government a yeshiva, a religious school that would allow them to come back and set root there as well. Madrid was silent on settlements and today we are paying the price that the reality is more settlements, expansion of settlements. Euphemisms are used. It's a settlement, no, it's an outpost. It's not a new settlement, it's an expansion of an existing settlement. I don't want to use a French words to, to, to describe to you my reaction to that, but settlements galore, I called it in a previous uh, interview as settle mania by Israel, more and more evictions. We've talked about Silwan, we've talked about Sheikh Jarrah, we've talked about all those Palestinians who are being kicked out of their houses. And all that, all that today is because the occupation continues, because there is impunity, because there is silence from the international community, and because Israel, using Jewish Zionism as its tool with Europe, is trying to snuff out, to crush out uh, Palestinian nationalism. That was Madrid Conference 1991, 30 years ago. Today, we have normalization with some countries. The United Arab Emirates and Bahrain are two clear examples. We have no hope for a viable uh, two-state solution. We have impunity, we have indifference, and the whole world is busy, not only with COVID and climate change, but also with all the hotspots around the world, including in the MENA and Gulf regions, from Yemen to Iraq that make the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict less uh, pressing and less dangerous. But what will eventually happen, and it is already happening with the younger Palestinian generations, is that as the two-state solution is being discarded, is proving to be 
unvi non-viable. People are beginning to think laterally, to think outside the box, to think of a different binational political reality, whatever its contours, that is rights-based. Many people, many think tanks, not least amongst them Carnegie Endowment, have reported on the fact that we're veering away from uh, the two-state solution to something else. And part of the reason is, as I told you, settlements, more settlements, more settlements, and more impunity exercised week in, week out. And that started publicly, at least, in Madrid. So you might ask me, what next, Harry, at the end of this YouTube episode? And I will tell you what I've always told you. I might have followed Madrid. I might have been fortunate enough to have a friend there uh, reporting back to me. I might have become involved with the conflict, written on it, spoken about it. But, hey, I'm not a prophet. But mind you, nor are most of the other players today. So let's wait and see. 30 years have passed to the public meetings that took place, the chin wagging that took place in Madrid in a very, very beautiful uh, palace. And in 2021, we are in a sad reality. Let's wait and see what happens next.